The church's teaching on human sexuality and the sacrament of marriage hasn't just been controversial for our generation. It's been controversial throughout the church's life, all the way from St. John the Baptist to today. We have a series of martyrs and people who were killed because of how they stood up for what Christ teaches us about the sacrament of marriage. And before we go into all the various controversies that exist within the life of the church, it's important for us to lay the foundation. And so today I'd like to speak to the fundamentals of the sacrament of marriage. I think it's important as disciples of the Lord to not start with controversial subjects. It's kind of like trying to teach children how to do conics before you teach them the basics of geometry. In some ways, when we're teaching the faith, we have to start with first principles before we get to the more complex issues. And so Jesus does this himself in scripture. He responds to the Pharisees' questions about what is the greatest of laws by reducing all of the law to that desire to love God with everything that we are and to love our neighbor. Jesus adds, he says, everything else hangs from these two laws. In other words, yes, there are complex principles and laws, but they all come from this original starting point. And so what I'd like to do today is offer the starting point with which how we can understand the sacrament of marriage. And maybe a good place to start is the garden. And so that's the first thing that God did was when he looked at Adam, he said, it is not good for man to be alone. St. John Paul II developed something called theology of the body. It's actually one of the main reasons why I'm still Catholic because a lot of the church's teaching is very difficult to accept, but when I studied St. John Paul II's explanation for it, it made a lot of sense and it was actually very positive. And so for my generation of Catholics that were struggling with understanding where the love in the church's teaching was, uh, that gave me answers. And if you're interested in looking more deeply into that, I highly recommend a book by the theologian named Christopher West, and it's called Theology of the Body for Beginners. Now, going on to the basics and fundamentals of marriage in the book of Genesis, the thing that God says about Adam is really important. First of all, St. John Paul II explains that this wasn't just spoken about the male Adam, it was spoken about all of humanity. And so, when God is saying it's not good for man to be alone, what he's saying is that in our solitude, there is a desire for communion. So human beings are not created to be islands onto themselves. We're created for a relationship and we're going to be unfulfilled without that relationship. And so relationships are good. So how does God remedy this? Well, ultimately God wants a relationship with us and that's the ultimate fulfillment of that longing for communion. But he does create something in between, which are other human beings, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. God creates woman and man in order to complement each other. And so their differences brings about a communion. So what is lacking in one is found in the other and the same vice versa. And so this is called complementarity. So when God creates Adam and Eve, they are of equal dignity. They're bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And yet they're also different. And it's in that difference, in that diversity, that they become one. St. John Paul II expounds on this and says that this is in fact a way of understanding how we're created in the image and likeness of a trinity. And so we're creating the image and likeness of God, who is one, but at the same time is also three persons. And so there's three relationships. And so with Adam being the lover and Eve being the beloved, we see that in the first and the second person of the Trinity. Sometimes in theology, we refer to the first person, the father as the lover and the second person as the beloved. And the beloved receives the love that comes from God, but only as a way to give that love back. It's not a self-serving type of belovedness. And so by receiving that gift of love, God the Father is being loved 
by the second person. And in that exchange of love between the first person and the second person of the Trinity, a third person is generated from all eternity, and that's the Holy Spirit. And so what do we see when God speaks to Adam and Eve? He commands them to be fruitful and multiply. That the love between two people is meant to go beyond itself, to transcend itself, and to generate a third person. Well, this is teaching us a lot about God. God here has created the universe out of an act of love. And the first thing he does to those human beings that are like him is he invites us to participate in creating out of an act of love with his help. So male and female get to create an immortal soul that can never be destroyed, which is not something even the angels enjoy. And it's with, of course, the help of God. And so this is an incredibly positive way to look at the relationship between husband and wife. And we see that it's ultimately representing our relationship with one another. And so God wants man and woman to be joined together, not in a competitive relationship, but in one that works together for a single purpose, that they become one flesh. St. John Paul II explains that in the very physiology and design of the body, we discover what he would call a theology, that we have our, as our bodies a visible sign or an image of who God is and what it means to be in relationship with him. So we know that body has language. We all have body language. And sometimes it's good body language. Sometimes it's passive aggressive body language. There's all sorts of different ways to communicate with our body. But what St. John Paul II is speaking about here is not so much what we do with our body, but in the body itself, it communicates purpose. So for example, our eyes are for seeing, our ears are for hearing. And we apply that principle consistently to the whole body. We don't get all relative when we go below the belt, but rather we see that our procreative dimension as human beings is actually a good. It's not something to be compartmentalized or turned off like a switch, but rather it's actually us participating in the greatness of God, something that God lovingly did and is the reason why we're here. God created. And so this participation in the creative power of God is an incredible gift that is a part of our identity. It's not just a function of what we are. It is a part of who we are. And so husband and wife as male and female, those identities to create in that way is a part of what we are. And Pope Francis speaks about this. He says that Men and women need to come to learn to accept their bodies as part of their identity. And so when a husband and a wife love each other, they need to love each other, not in an abstract way, but to love each other's bodies as well, to love their own and to give their body to each other as a gift. And so we make another connection here between Christ and the church. Christ gives his body on the cross to the church, his wife, he is in this act of giving the husband of the church, imitating the father's love. He becomes the lover to us and we become his bride, the beloved in which we receive that gift of love as a way of accepting and including him in our lives. In a sense, Christ is proposing a marriage to all of us at the altar. And when we say amen, we're saying yes to that incredible proposal and what a joy we give to the Lord when we surrender to that. So this is ultimately marriage. Marriage is a sacrament. And what the church teaches is that marriage is ultimately meant to be a visible sign of how Christ loved his church. There's four ways in which St. John Paul II breaks down this love for the church. And what I like about that is we're not leaving the word love abstract where it could be twisted into anything we want it to be, but there's a concrete way to understand it. So the first way that Christ loved his church was with free love. And so this is kind of an unconditional love, but it's also a love that doesn't have necessarily any fear attached to. This is interior freedom that we're not loving each other because we're coerced into doing it. God didn't love the human race because he was lonely. He loved us for our own sake. And so married love is called to imitate the same thing. 
They do acts of charity for one another. They love each other, not with bargaining, not with contracts, but just out of gener generosity that they give to one another. And so when Christ loved us, he wasn't waiting for us to become perfect. Christ loved us even as we were sinners. The second type of love that Christ loved his church with is total. The word body that's used in Greek at the Last Supper, Jesus is actually using a word that means my whole self, not just my flesh. And so Christ gives us everything that he is, and he wants us to assimilate everything that he is into everything that we are. So he wants to love every part of us as God has designed it and created it to be. And so he gave us everything he is, his body, his soul, and his blood. And so married couples are called to imitate the same thing, not to compartmentalize any aspect of themselves that has been created by God, but to give themselves in every dimension to each other. And this is most profoundly incarnational in the act of sexual intercourse, where the movements of the heart are complete gift of myself to the other, receiving them or giving ourselves to the other. And that includes, of course, the procreative dimension, which is a part of what we are. And so the third way that Christ loved his church was faithfully. Christ loved his church, and even if we reject him and we decide to turn around and ask him for forgiveness, he will be faithful to us and forgive us. And so Christ's faithfulness means that Christ would never divorce us that we could walk away and be separated from him. That's of our own free will. But if we choose to be reunited to him through the sacrament of reconciliation and baptism, that God will restore that relationship. And so this is a covenant that God is creating with the human race. And therefore, the church doesn't accept divorce and remarriage unless an annulment has taken place. Now, I'm not going to be able to speak to the complexities of that subject, which require their own video. But basically, an annulment is saying that the marriage may have legally and ritualistically occurred, but something was missing before the sacrament could actually be given over to those people. And so an annulment means perhaps that there wasn't consent. Maybe someone was pretending to be someone, but they really weren't. And so the bride or the groom was saying yes to X when that person was really Y. And so God doesn't allow for divorce because a husband and a wife are meant to reflect and be a visible sign of how Christ loved his church and Christ would never divorce us. And so that's an important clarification. And it's again, one of those subjects that we could spend a lot of, lot more time on but it's understanding that the call to marriage in the church is a call to greatness. It's called to be something more than just human love. It's a call to image for the world, divine love. And God believes that we're capable of doing that with his help. The last is Christ loved the church fruitfully. Christ wants to allow his father to adopt all of us. And it's from the cross that the baptismal waters flow from his side. And so he wants us to welcome as much new life as possible into the life of the church. And this means that we're called to evangelize everyone. And it means that we're not going to exclude anyone, but we're going to send out the proposition of the faith and include everyone in that invitation. And so how does this apply to marriage? Well, we know the procreative dimension is definitely a part of it, and we've already spoken to that. But the point here is that Fruitful love means it goes beyond itself. It transcends, it transcends itself. It's like a cup that just is overflowing and it's building the community and civilization. And so God wants in that act of love for it to give life, both biological and spiritual. Not all families are able to have children. Sometimes there's procreative disorders that don't allow women or men to have children. Or sometimes there's just difficulties and grave reasons to avoid a pregnancy. And there's the right way and the wrong way to avoid that. And again, that's a whole other topic. But the point is, is that God wants our love to be something beyond just the two people. He wants it to flow over, to serve the interests of the whole community, 
to never be stagnant and sterile, but always to be a source of growth for everyone else. And so husband and wife all of a sudden become this living embodiment, this living gospel, if you will, of how Christ loved his church. And they show the world that it is possible to love as Christ has loved the church. And through the husband and the wife, we believe that it's not merely a symbol. We believe that by the power of God's grace, that his love actually comes through them. And I've witnessed this. I've witnessed this with husbands and wives being able to forgive each other after great difficulties and great sins have divided them. And so God can give that supernatural grace. All we need to do is turn to him and look for it. Let's end with a prayer for married couples. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all married couples who endure difficult trials. I ask you to support them and renew them in a trust for your grace to overcome all difficulties, to forgive, and to seek as part of the mission of the church to embody for the rest of the world the hope that comes from knowing how you have loved us in the very relationship that they have with one another. May it never just serve themselves, but always serve the benefit of the whole church. And may they recognize with confidence by the spirit with which gives them the power to do this. And we ask for the intercession of St. John Paul II. Pray for us. God bless you. Oh,